Så drager den ind i vores. Vi skal blive fast. Så kan vi slås jo. Kan du høre mig nu? Det er svært at høre. Ah, okay, fine. Okay, so um, I'm going to show you uh, array programming, and I'm going to show you how to do array programming in this language that I've developed with along with other people called Futag. I'm going to show you how we how a new language can at all be useful by showing how it can easily interoperate with Python, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how the performance of this language is compared to handwritten GPU code. Okay. First thing, there's two kinds of parallelism. The one that most people think about when they think parallelism is uh, task parallelism, where you uh, spawn a thread, and the thread can go and do whatever on some data. And you can spawn another thread, we can go and do something entirely else on, on some, maybe the same data, maybe something else. But the two threads are completely independent of each other. The parallelism is where you take the same function, or do the same operation, on multiple elements of some data set. Um, so the, the simplest example is what we in functional program call the map, which takes two arguments, a function and an array, and just give you back a new array where that function has been applied to each element of the array. So I'm going to use, in, in Futag we use this notation for a function applications without parentheses. So this says apply the function map to f and this array. All right, no, no, nothing magical going on here. Array programming is an instance of data parallelism. And you've probably already done so because NumPy for Python and similar um, libraries of other languages is an instance of array programming where we um, do bulk operations. So we just say we want an array of 10 elements. Each of those elements we want to multiply by two uh, and keeps giving us back a new array. And then we can multiply these two arrays pointwise and then sum the results. That's just a dot dot product we're doing here. So this idea of doing bulk operations on, on arrays, which can be very large, is a very good way of doing parallelism in a way that's easy for humans to think about and very efficient on massively parallel hardware like GPUs. Array programming is actually a pretty old model. It was seen first APL, um, which was not popular for some reason. Um, you also need a special keyboard to type it. So mm -hmm. let's, uh, <laughs> let's not do any more APL. This is Futark, which you can type with an ordinary keyboard. Um, it's, uh, it's a very small language. It's kind of a, it looks a little bit like standard ML or Haskell or some other generic uh, func functional language if you've seen it before. We can define a function that takes this input an array of length n and gives us back an array of length n and just adds two to every element of that array. Or we can define a function that sums an array using reduce, which is a functional language lingo for use this function to um, turn this array of values into just one, one value. Conceptually, it just puts this function, uh, bet uh, this operator between each of the elements in the array. So that's that sums an array. Um, and this function can be any uh, binary function. It has to be associative to be parallel, but let's not worry about that. Uh, that's a little esoteric. The nice thing about Futag is that it's very free form. So when you find a function that, it, that has some parallelism inside, you can still use it inside of another parallel context. So you can do map where we use the sum function that we defined up here. So now you have two layers of parallelism. You have a map on the outside and a reduce on the inside. That's called nested parallelism, and it's comparatively rare because it's tricky to compile. And one thing that the Fuga compiler will do is turn this uh, nested parallelism, which is nice for humans and nice and composable, uh, into flat parallelism, which is the only kind that hardware can be handled. So you have just one level of parallelism. That's tricky, um, and it won't fit an explanation of how to do that. Unfortunately, it won't fit in a 20 minute talk. Uh, so I won't talk that much about that. Futag also has um, sequential loops. It's a pure language, so there's no destructive updates, so you can kind of fake them um, by saying, okay, start with a, with a, with a value x that's equal, equal to 1, then um, run this number of iterations, and for each iteration, compute a new value of x with this expression, so multiply x with i plus 1, and then run the loop again until i hits n, and then x is, uh, is returned. So it's also just a static sugar for a tail recursive function if you're used to functional programming. Arrays can be constructed in, uh, with some uh, building constructs, IOTA, um, which gives us back, and it's just like range in Python, so it gives us back an, an, a range of consecutive integers, or replicate, which copies some value. And the arguments to replicate can also be arrays, but we won't, I won't be using that. So, on to an example. This is a Mandelbrot set, or, or this is a visualization of part of Mandelbrot set. The way to create these nice graphics is just to apply this uh, simple function written in Python to a bunch of comps numbers. And you can turn 
This function just sees how many times this complex number can go through this loop without this condition becoming true and with this um, cutoff point, so you don't need it forever. Uh, and then you just return how many times you went through the loop, and you can use that number to turn it into a pretty car. And then you can uh, get a nice visualization. But it's basically just boils down to running this pretty simple function. And but since you run the same function on a whole bunch of complex numbers at once, you can do that in parallel. Uh, in NumPy, it would look like this, where we have an array of complex numbers, and then we do some, um, some weird uh, operations. We, for each of these dumb complex numbers, we compare them to, uh, this is the, the stop condition, um, and then we figure out which ones did not stop yet, and then we, for those that uh, didn't, have, didn't stop yet, we set the escape count to the loop count, and it's very complicated. And the, the original simple control that we had before in our mathematical definition is kind of gone and obscured. But even worse, not, not only is it unreadable, it's also so, and that's what I care the most about. Because for every iteration of this loop, which is usually on the order of maybe 200, 300, could, could, could be whatever you want, but it's usually fairly large, we write three arrays. So that means we are bound by memory speed. We constantly write these arrays that might be very large memory, um, which is a problem, because memory is very, very slow. Um, and I'll show you just how slow in a moment. In Futa, it looks like this. We have our sequential function that I showed you before. Um, which, uh, well, I showed you in, in Python before, it's just right, written in Futuk, just the same thing. Um, let me just map that on a two-dimensional array of complex numbers. And it's two-dimensional because you really use this normal for visualization of the complex plane. It could be one-dimensional if, if you had some other uh, interests. Um, so the interesting thing here is that there's only, really, there's only a one array written because we just go through all, over all complex numbers on this simple scalar function, which don't use any array, so we can just keep it all in registers. That's a comp compiler detail, but that's generally something that the, that the program can rely on. Um, uh, primitive values are kept in registers. And then at the end, um, a two-dimensional array is written to memory. Uh, so the performance difference between these two styles uh, is something like this. I mean, they both scale pretty well as the number of, uh, of, of complex numbers we're working on increases. But if you see where they top out, I mean, this is a NumPy style where you write a lot of arrays. It, 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 it top out at 12 times faster than sequential code. And this is all, this is not, this is not Python code. This is um, C, uh, C, uh, GPU code written in a NumPy style, but it's not Python code. Um, but in Futag style, where we don't have all these memory accesses, it becomes 350 times faster than sequential code, sequential C code. Um, that's a significant difference, and that's entirely down to this, uh, what's the so-called memory wall, that modern computation is so, so much faster than, than uh, modern memory banks, that, that you really, the only, I mean, touching memory is just a killer. If you write real right from memory, your program is going to be slow. Uh, that's it. So we do it because we kind of have to sometimes. Unfortunately, we, the user can't see the value of registers. So sometimes we do have to write memory, or even worse, to disk or to screen or what have you. Well, you want to avoid it. It's a very, very bad idea if you want our code to run fast. So, um, Futag is a little bit tricky uh, because it's a pure language. So, one thing is you don't have mutable variables. You also don't have the ability to write to the screen or to a file or anywhere. So, running it is a little bit exotic. You, have, you can compile a Futag program. Um, and that's done by writing a main function that takes some input and produces some output. Um, in this case, I just make up some complex numbers. I haven't shown you this function. It doesn't matter. It just makes up an array of complex numbers, runs the function I showed you before, and it sums them all up to produce one integer. So that sums all of the escape values of all these complex numbers. It doesn't produce, doesn't compute anything meaningful. Um, when we want to run this program, we have to tell Futak, okay, run this function uh, with these arguments, and give me the result. And do that by just compiling it using the compiler. Um, and then you pass this input in standard input, and you get back output on standard output, um, which is a weird thing, but uh, Unix people like this. <laughs> in this case, I've also asked the okay, so f when compiling a full track program to standalone program, it's not for production use, it's for deep it's debugging and benchmarking. So it has some, some useful flags. One of these is dash T, which asks it to benchmark itself. So in this case, it says, okay, I can, this is a result. And this is a runtime in microseconds, so 611,000 microseconds. Um, this is using the Futag C compiler, which generates um, sequential C code that is then compiled with GCC. With also the Futag OpenShell compiler, which generates GPU code. 
and it runs just seven and a half milliseconds, so 80 times faster, without any changes to the program itself. And the program itself doesn't really talk about GPUs at all. It just uses these um, uh, parallel oper operates map in this case, and it just magically runs faster when uh, when run with the when compiled with the OpenGL compiler. But um, this is not the way you really want to use Futa. You have a nice command line program for some your Mandelbrot sets, but that's not really what anyone needs in practice. So um, the trick here is how OpenGL works, which is a library you use to. There's two libraries for communicating with GPUs. One is Kuba, Nvidia's uh, proprietary thing, and OpenGL, which is an open standard, but it's much nastier to use for manual programming. It's nice as a compiler target, though. So the way it works is you actually have two programs. You have a program running on the GPU called the host which uh, uploads code and data to the GPU, which is one time kind of like a slave that you just send, send, uh, send the command and, uh, and data to. Um, so the interesting thing here is that the CPU code doesn't actually compute that much in a well-written program where the, where the parallel sequences are large. It's just bookkeeping, so it doesn't have to be fast. In particular, you can have the CPU code be in some high-level language that's easy to integrate with, but, but and just talk to the GPU for you. So. Um, the way we've done this is that we have added a code generator where the host level code, you know, the CPU level code, the code you, that you see is written in Python. Um, so this compiler generates Python that internally makes calls to this OpenGL library to upload code and data to the GPU. So you just use a different compiler called Futurak Pi OpenGL and you ask it to create a library and then it produces a Python module, mandelbrot.py, which from the outside looks like any ordinary Python module. So you can open a, start a Python, you can import it, and then it's kind of, there's a kind of strange thing about how you have to use it. it. It defines a class that you instantiate to some GPU state stuff. And then that class or that object defines a method for every entry point in the original food track program. In this case, that's only the main function. And you just pass that ordinary Python values, uh, and you get back like ordinary Python values as a result. And behind the scenes, it has compiled some GPU code, and it's asking the GPU to execute this function for these arguments, and you can call it again, and it'll give you back, back a different result. And for passing arrays and getting back arrays from the GPU, it uses uh, NumPy um, arrays, so you can pretty easily integrate it with, uh, with the existing Python libraries, although, of course, NumPy arrays are going to be on the GPU, so there's going to be some cost of copying back and forth. So you can use that if you really want to sum up your Mandelbrot uh, sets. Um, or we could modify that program a little bit, and instead of just summing up those escapes, you could, could turn them into uh, RGB pixel values and give us back an array, a 2D array of pixel values. And then we can use something like Pygame to just bleed it to the screen. And then we would get something like uh, this, an uh, interactive Mandelbrot viewer with a Python front end for, for uh, handling all uh, the keyboard commands and all that stuff. But with all the computation happening on my Intel GPU in real time, um, much, much faster than the CPU could ever hope to do this. Um, so a pretty nice division of work between a restricted high-performance language and a very flexible, dynamic, high-level Python language. Okay. Uh, so the only reason you'd ever want to use a restricted high-performance language is to get high performance, because it's better than, it's, it's not a terrible language, I don't think, after all this time. Maybe that's my Stockholm syndrome talking. But it's not as nice as you didn't have to use it. So is it fast? Is it worth it? Well, it depends, because I can easily just show you some benchmarks that show that it's much faster than everything else. Uh, but you shouldn't really trust that, because it's very, very hard to quantify whether a language is fast. The only way I found that I just trust uh, the this least amount is to take existing programs that are, that are said to be written in a good and decent way, and then port them to my language and say, well, this is how fast it is now. Unfortunately, most benchmarks not been are not really, uh, don't really implement algorithms that are designed to be parallel. So it's kind of, I can't use the normal language benchmark sh shootout game, the one that Debian has or whatever, because those are usually sequential programs, and many of them require side effects in writing to files, screen and whatever, and the language can't really do that. But there is a benchmark suite called Dynia, which I don't expect anyone to know unless they've done uh, 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 HPC in academia. Yeah. Uh, it's handwritten open CL code, so handwritten GPU code. Uh, of very varying quality. Uh, so much of it is written by uh, doctors who should really stick to human bodies and write code, uh, or by physicists, which is unreadable but at least fast. So, we port <laughs> so we've, so we've uh, ported some of these uh, Virginia benchmarks to Futag and we run them on 
put an in, in NVIDIA GPU and an AMD GPU, and uh, these are the speed outs we get compared to the original code. I don't know if anyone, can, if you can see these small numbers, but for this one, the, the full track version is four times faster than the handwritten version on an NVIDIA GPU, and the, on an AMD GPU is two times faster. Of course, this, this just this most means that the original program is bad. There's no way a compiler should be able to generate code that is significantly better than something written by an expert uh, who, put, who put enough time to it to uh, write good code. So these are not these benchmarks are not sufficient are not very good, uh, except some of them where we don't manage to beat handwritten code, but we get close. And of course, the full track code is vastly easier to modify and understand and extend. That, that's what we're going for. We're not really trying to beat. Uh, handwritten code written by experts. We're just trying to get close and providing a much better programming experience along the way. And this time we're 17 times faster because they got something that was parallel that really isn't. I mean, yeah. So it's hard to prove that your language is good when everyone writes so slow code. Uh, <laughs> so I'm sorry, it's a small language. It's very simple to learn. It's high level, so it's not actually GPU oriented. We could generate multi-core GPU code as well. It's purely functional, which is weird, but fits this paradigm pretty well. It's data parallel, so there's in inbuilt uh, operators that have parallel meaning and the compiler understands and can optimize them. And we, we currently have a compiler that generates good GPU code. In the future, it will also be able to generate good CPU code and maybe even cluster code. We haven't done that yet. We have an, a good idea how we can integrate that with other languages and applications, not just Python, that's what we have right now, but we could easily create an Erlang or Ruby or C Sharp or whatever uh, from Java, doesn't matter, this is the host code is very simple. And the performance is, uh, is okay. We've also tried on more challenging benchmarks where we don't beat them quite as much, but do pretty respectably. And of course, the full track code is much easier to understand. And it's all uh, available online and open and on an ISC license and all, and all that stuff. All right, so that's it. Thank you very much, Truls. Time yeah. for questions. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, uh, so um, I've got a question. We have a Python uh, interface, uh, and I was asked, we also have a C interface. Do is not quite as mature because C doesn't have a well-defined stand for what a multi-dimensional array should look like. For example, in Python, we could just use NumPy conventions, but it should be very easy, and we do generate uh, so C code that works fine as a standalone executable, and it would be easy to make that a library too. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's what the, that's what the. Uh, so I was asked whether we have a compiler that uses the C wrapper instead of the open Python wrapper. That's what this one does. It just doesn't have the dash dash library uh, option, so it doesn't generate fully re reusable code. It doesn't generate the fi the nice wrapper uh, code. But that's just because again, C doesn't have. Uh, the equivalent of NumPy that we, you know, some conventions that we can just adopt. So it requires a little bit more thought about how we create an API for this. But I could, I could get a C code generated by this. Yeah, yeah. Compile it and yeah, sure, yes. I mean, you could do it manually, yeah. One question? Yeah. Well, what runtime do you like Sorry? Uh, so it doesn't require much because NVIDIA doesn't bother support. So I was asked about which, what, what I was support is necessary. Okay, so there's two answers to that. The first is I have often questioned the wisdom of doing a PhD that requires working graphics drivers on Linux. <laughs> <laughs> you can't get them. You, already know, you all know that problem. The second is uh, OpenShell itself. NVIDIA doesn't like OpenShell much. They support it, but they support a fairly old version. And since NVIDIA hardware is so popular, we can't use features that are newer than, open, than from OpenShell 2, I think. That's the newest NVIDIA support. That's also all we, we, we need. It works on, on all CPUs I've seen, NVIDIA, AMD, and Intel, and also an AMD one, I think, uh, an ARM one at some point, I think, I tried it out. Uh, so we don't, we don't use any fancy features. Um. More questions? Have you also tried this on Xeon Phi systems, so not GPUs? <laughs> yes. Uh, I tried on the CN5. Uh, it doesn't run very fast. It runs correctly. It's portable open shield code. But the compiler has some assumptions about how memory should be accessed to be fast that is valid on, on all modern GPUs, but it's not valid on, valid on CN5 as fast as I can see. So there's a significant slowdown. 
Uh, but that could be fixed. That's just about tweaking the correlation pipeline for CNFIs, I think. Uh, but I don't know that much. And that's an old CNFI. They made a new one. I haven't tried that one yet. Okay, thank you very much, Drew. <laughs> Again, next up is the lightning talk session. If you stay here for the first lightning talk, you stay also for the last one. There's no movement. One out. Very cool work. The laptop is below. Okay. Yes, you're in two. But we have a single left for all your light Yeah, there should be 10 minutes. Because, you know, I guess. Yeah, you can use your Obviously, because I can't. Okay, for using this charge. Oh, sure, 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 yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So. Let me just test it. Uh, Try and make sure you get all the lightning talk people already. Mm -hmm. Presenters. So yeah, so I see all of uh, us uh, here. Yeah. Uh, I see Holden. Holden was there. Yeah, maybe they run out. Uh, Nico, so at least three. Can right? you so come up here? Sure. So Nico is here, so that's four. Yeah, yeah Nico and his friend, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And he, I haven't seen B yet. Do you also do it then? Uh, no, it's just because I'm using the JavaScript density thing. So. Yeah, that's a good PDF version. That's, that's a zipper code. Oh, okay. So, am I now announced or what do I do now? Okay. You already control it. No, no, I understand. Okay, yeah, so I have a piece of project. Yeah, you're doing all I have. Go back. Well, B is not here yet, which is the last. It's more than half an hour away. Where do we put that? Um, uh, I'm doing a dining hall. Yes. Yeah, so we basically have everything preloaded from this laptop. Right. And as long as you don't have anything specific that you need us to like a demo or anything, we'll no. be using this one. Okay, better for me. It's possible. Right? You can get you check if B is outside. <laughs> Can I just... Sure, just throw it in the corner. Yeah. Throw it in the corner. Yeah. Nice. Is B here already? The last speaker for the lightning talk? B? No? Speaking of...